All right, so it is Reformation Sunday, and um, we will be doing, of course, all our Reformation Sunday activities uh, later on today, and uh, Pastor Ansel is going to be preaching on uh, a topic that fits in with Reformation Sunday, and, and everything that they're setting up outside for later on has to do with the Reformation. What I want us to do today, then, is just spend a few minutes looking at the Reformation as a, in terms of a big picture. And what I mean by that is it's very easy to sit there and talk about Martin Luther in 1517 on October 31st, how he took the 95 Theses and nailed them to the door in Wittenberg there in Germany, and everything that happened after that. Or we might focus perhaps on Calvin, or we might focus on something uh, in particular and fold that. And that's what we do year after year, and that's a good thing. Helps us to understand, but sometimes it's necessary to take a step back and look at the whole picture without getting into all the nitty gritty and just say, what was the Reformation and how has it impacted us today? So really what I want us to do is, we are of course Presbyterian, we are in a denomination called the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Where did that come from? You know, Who are we in terms of the Reformation? What about churches like the Lutheran Church or Baptists? Where do they all fit in? What does it mean to be a Reformational Church? So what I really want us to do is, like, like I said, just take a step back and look at what happened in terms of the church back in the time of the Reformation and go from there. So it's more as a, a historical overview of how the church has developed since then. So that's what we're gonna try to do this morning. So to start off with that, let's go ahead and take a look at what the church was like before the Reformation, and we'll do that just briefly. But before the Reformation, it uh, might be easy to sit there and think, well, there was only one church, but that wasn't necessarily even true then. Let's say it's now 1500 or 1450, take your pick. Uh, how many, if you wanna use the modern day term, how many denominations were there? Pretty much those two, pretty much those two, yep. So you had the Western Church and the Eastern Church. And the Western Church called itself Catholic, the Eastern Church called itself Orthodox. Those are terms that developed a little bit later. But um, we tend to think today and we say Roman Catholic Church or Eastern Orthodox Church. Of course, those two terms, which just helps to kind of understand what they mean, when we think of the Western Church and we say, well, that's Catholic or the Eastern Church, that's Orthodox, we may not realize that those are terms that apply to the whole of the church. Anybody know what Orthodox means? So, okay, it comes from, uh, ever heard of an orthopedist? You know, or you know, something of the orthodontist, right? An orthodontist gives you what? Straight teeth, that's actually the word ortho is from straight, and then the dentist part has to do with your teeth, so straight teeth, straightens out your teeth. Orthodoxy um, means straight thinking or right thinking. So the church claims to be orthodox means that it hasn't become heretical, it's staying on the teaching that is correct. Um, so that's something that applies to all the churches that are true churches, not just those in the East. Likewise, churches in the West that took on the name Catholic, what does the term Catholic mean? Say again? I just heard universal and? Okay, and unity. So uh, universal is certainly a part of Catholicity and it refers to being all part of one body. It doesn't just mean universal, that it's everywhere but it means that there is a unity, as Mrs. Alexander was pointing out, that they're tied in one organism, one organization, that kind of thing. And so in that respect, you might say, well, the church wasn't Catholic and that it had divided over an issue uh, in the 11th century, middle of the 11th century. But the idea is that we're ultimately all mystically united one with the other, and the church in that sense is universal and goes across. And not just geographically, but that Catholicity also means that it happens even through time and we're united with one another throughout. Um, in other words, we are united to the saints who were pilgrims that we're gonna be looking at today, later in our activities and so on. So you had this, this church that already was, as it were, divided between the East and the West in the medieval era. We're gonna be focusing on that Western church, which is where our roots are and where the Reformation occurred. 
And what happened with that church is it had begun to deviate from some very, very important things that we believe are essential. Uh, one of those was that it had begun to set up two levels of authority. On one sen- in one sense, you had, I mean, on one side, you had the Bible, right? It's supposed to be a Bible. And they had another authority. Anybody know what that was? Yeah, you might, well, when we say the church, what do we really mean? A bunch of guys with pointy hats. It's actually more like that, isn't it? The authority had come, be- uh, had come to be split between what the Bible said and tradition what the church says about the Bible and what the church says about anything had become in and of itself authoritative. Interestingly enough, I heard somebody say the Pope, the idea of the Pope being infallible, uh, speaking in a way that he makes no mistakes and everything he says is right, was not a Reformation view. Even they, they held to that view, but it wasn't actually officially part of Roman Catholic canon until 1871, uh, which shows you just how late some of that stuff took to catch up. But the idea was you had these two competing authorities. So you had the word of God, and you had tradition. And by the way, whenever you set up any competing authority with the Bible, guess which one always wins out? The one that's not the Bible, exactly. And so this is the, the fu- <coughs> excuse me, the fundamental issue. Everything that flowed, all the mistakes and all the errors that came out of Um, or that we look at in the medieval era, flowed out from this, once you get to this point. It got so bad that uh, by the time of, let's say, John Wycliffe, which you might remember we studied here just a few years ago during Reformation Sunday, by the time of John Wycliffe, most priests in England didn't even know what the Bible said, if they even had a Bible. But they were being taught to just go through certain motions and do certain things, and you know, that, would, that would have been sufficient. So the medieval church starts with this fundamental flaw that begins to affect everything. And the key area in which then it started making real changes was in how we are saved. And just for the sake of making things very, very simple, I'm simplifying quite a bit here, they had gotten to the point where your salvation came through Jesus plus. And we're just going to leave it at that. We look at the scripture and we see that Jesus dies in our place and lives a perfect life in our place, dies in our place to pay the penalty we owe God and so on. And that what Jesus does is sufficient. It's all you need for salvation. You don't need to add anything to it. But in the medieval era, you had Jesus plus. And most of it was the things that you have to do, your righteousness. You have to live up to what, uh, what God requires. And it is true that God requires perfection of us. But the great doctrines that we hold to in Scripture, like justification, that says that Jesus' righteousness is given to us. We do need to be perfect, but it's his perfection that we, that we get when we put our trust in him and so on. Those were things that had fallen away. They were not, just to be sure, these doctrines were not developed exclusively in the time of the Reformation. It's not like they came into being during the time of the Reformation. They had fallen away by that time. So that was the significant problem. So what I'm gonna do now is really just talk about very briefly the overview of what the Reformation did for us in terms of the church. So that's just setting the stage. So basically what you have is, as we said, Martin Luther, and normally we would talk a long time about Luther and how he did this and that and so on. I'm just gonna presume that you have studied that to some extent or that you remember some of the things we've talked about in the past. But God uses Luther to begin to wake up the Western church, what today we would call the Roman Catholic church, but it was just the medieval church of the West, on these two points that we've been looking at, the authority of the word of God and the idea that our salvation comes wholly through Christ, that it is the righteousness of Christ that we need, not our own righteousness. So again, those are points that normally we would unpack. I'm not gonna unpack them right now. But it starts with him reaching out and uh, uh, challenging the church. He did not mean to start other churches. He did not mean to break up the church. He meant to reform the church, hence the name the Reformation, to correct the church and to have it 
redirect itself in terms of its theology, in terms of its doctrine, and so on. So that's what Luther did. And what we ended up then is, um, actually, I suppose I could have brought a map of Europe. What we end up in, just for the sake of simplicity, is you end up with the northern um, part of Europe, generally speaking, uh, listening to that message and moving in the direction of what Luther was teaching. And today that's come to be known as Lutheranism. If you are a Lutheran, you follow those things. But Luther, uh, in his day, would never have you know, allowed it to be called Lutheranism. And so those churches were called evangelical churches because the word evangel simply means the gospel. These churches had gotten back to grabbing a hold of the gospel. And so they were known as evangelical churches. Now, anybody know what year Luther did his thing? I think I already said it at the beginning, but anybody remember? That's right, I heard 1517, didn't I? Yes, I'm sure I did. So in 1517, Luther does that, and he gets things going, and everybody talks about Calvin then doing the other movement, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, called Reform. But Calvin is the junior of Luther. He's young enough to be his son. Uh, uh, Calvin is born in 1509. So he's eight years old when Luther does uh, his nailing of the theses. So that gives you an idea of, of the age. There's a man that we don't talk very much about. So we've got Martin Luther on one side, who starts what were called the evangelical churches. Today we call those Lutheran. And then you have what came to be known as the Reformed churches. That name never changed. So you've got Martin Luther here. Is that too small? Can we see that? And then we got a guy who's got a real name that doesn't translate as well as Martin. Ulrich Zwingli. Where do you come up with these names? And what was happening is, while Luther was doing his thing, almost immediately, like within a year, 1518, you see Zwingli resonating with him and writing his own stuff that begins to push the churches more in the southern part. Zwingli is in Zurich, which is in Switzerland. Uh, so you've got Luther up in Germany. And as I said, I'm kind of condensing everything here. As the message of Reformation spreads throughout Germany, it spreads into the countries that today uh, we would call Scandinavian countries. All those become Lutheran. Again, call themselves evangelical in those days. In the southern part, you get what's churches that are called Reformed. And these churches, the you know, very name tells you, they are reforming from the Roman Catholic Church, from the medieval church. Ulrich Zwingli was the guy who was moving that forward. As I said, Calvin was just still a kid, I'm sure a very bright kid, but he still wasn't on the scene uh, by, by any stretch of the imagination. So Zwingli is the one who begins moving the church, and you might say, well, what's the difference between these guys? Well, right up, up until just almost the very end, they seem to be tracking step by step. All the important things seem to be the same. It's just that they start in two different areas geographically, and things begin to move forward. But at some point, you can imagine, they become aware of one another, and at some point you begin to develop two different organizations, which is exactly what happened. And they look at one another and say, this is silly, you know, we really should, uh, uh, as it were, put, bring everything together, shake hands and make everything work. And so what you find is in 1529, the churches get together. I don't know if you could see that. It's kind of light, isn't it? In a city called Marburg, And they have a, basically a workshop, a conference. It's called the Marburg Colloquy. And what happens is Luther and Zwingli, along with you know, their staff and their representatives and all that, get together. It's now 12 years since Luther started the Reformation and about 11 years after Zwingli's been doing his thing. So these are both guys who have been working on this stuff for a while now. And they get together and they wanna just make sure that everybody's on the same page. And they go through a whole list of different doctrines and commitments and beliefs, and everything seems to be tracking. You know, Jesus, uh, 
is divine. Jesus is the one who saves. It's all him and so on. Just boom, 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 going down the line. Everything is lining up. You would think, okay, we're gonna bring Northern Europe and Southern Europe together uh, and everything's going to be cool until they get to the Lord's Supper. And this is where they really begin to knock heads. Because in the Roman system, in the medieval system, the whole idea of the Lord's Supper was that the bread and the wine literally turn into the body and the blood of Jesus. To use the, the term from that great uh, set of theologians, Calvin and Hobbes, uh, the elements transmogrify. The word they actually used was transub uh, transubstantiation. So in other words, it changes its substance. And so the, the elements actually turn into the body and blood of Jesus. And that created all sorts of problems uh, in terms of idolatry. And see, these are some of the things that were going on in the, in the Reformation. I reduced it just to the simple stuff about, you know, the authority of the word of God and what it is to be saved. But there were all sorts of things. The Reformation ultimately was not just doctrinal, but it was a change in our worship. It was a revival as well as a reformation. And it changed the way that we worship. And one of the things that it did is it looked and it said, you know, this whole idea of the bread and the, and the wine literally turning into Christ and then we worship it because that's what they were doing. They literally would hold up the elements and people would bow down to it and all sorts of silly idolatrous things. And so all that, was something that was rejected at the Reformation. But then the question is, and this is what happens very often even today in denominations. We know what we're against, but now we gotta figure out what we are for. <laughs> so the Lutherans and the Reform knew that they were against the idolatrous idea of Jesus, uh, literally, you know, the bread literally becoming the body of Jesus and so on. But now they had to say, well, what does happen in the Lord's Supper? And that's where some of the problems began. On the Lutheran side, well, let me take Zwingli first. Zwingli held to the view that the Lord's Supper was uh, a remembrance of the sacrifice of Jesus. We call that a memorial, you remember, right? When we do a memorial service for someone who died, we remember their lives. So the Lord's Supper is a memorial. We simply remember the death of Christ, and that's it. So sometimes we call that a bare memorial. You remember, and that's all that's going on. Nothing beyond just simply talking about it, remembering it, moving on. Luther said, but Jesus keeps saying, this is my body. So in some way, Luther is insisting, he's really here. This bread somehow really is Jesus. This wine really is Jesus. So not in the way that it's put forth in the Roman Catholic Church, but in the way that, you know, somehow it's, so what he came up with was rather than transubstantiation, he came up with consubstantiation which is that Jesus' body and his blood makes an appearance at the Lord's Supper. The bread doesn't turn into the bread, but uh, into the body, but somehow Jesus' body sort of hovers over, around, and through, and so on. He's present, but he's invisible. And same thing with the wine. And Zwingli found that ridiculous and offensive, and they could not agree on these two things. So, uh, or rather, on this one thing. So unfortunately, the Marburg Colloquy, even though they may have found like 30 points of agreement, could not bring the two churches together because they couldn't get past this one point. And almost everything now that has happened in church history is as a result of this. Hmm. Isn't that crazy? So I'm going to erase that, and then from here, I'm going to start working out what I wanted to show you, the churches panning out from that. So unfortunately... That's 1529, 1531, um, Roman Catholics and the Reformed in Switzerland. Switzerland is made up of these big states that are called cantons, and some the, the rulers decide they're gonna be Roman Catholic and stay Roman Catholic, others decide they're gonna be Reformed. Sooner or later it came to arms and there's a civil war, and uh, Zwingli is the chaplain for uh, one of the troops one, uh, that are obviously on the Reformed side, he gets killed at, uh, uh, the, the Battle of Capel in 1531. So he's out of the picture. The Reform don't have a natural leader. They have guys like Bullinger and others who are really, really good scholars, but it, that was in 1531. It awaits Calvin to show up on the scene in 1536. So he shows up, a young man of 27 years of age, and again, I'm not gonna go into all of Calvin and so on, but he becomes, as it were, the leader from that point of the Reformed churches. So you would think that if this is the case, we would only have two churches today, in addition to the Roman Catholic Church, which are those elements of the medieval church that did not reform. 
So you've got the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran churches, and the Reformed churches, but there's quite a few more churches than that. Anybody know where the other ones came from? Want to take a stab? What? Here. What's here? That's certainly a part of it. Yeah, I think we'll see that as, as we get to that, yeah, that, that expansion. But there's a little bit more that happens still on the European continent. And so let's take a look at that with the, uh, the time that we have remaining because that's really where we begin to see the Reformation breaking out. So Lutheranism takes hold, as I said, in Northern Europe for the most part. Like everything else, some areas decide to remain Roman Catholic and it quickly becomes political, just which uh, um, ruler, which magistrate, which you know, prince, uh, he just kind of looks and there are some that do it out of conviction. Uh, they really were uh, converted to, to uh, Reformation thinking. Uh, they really were saved. Others just kind of look and say, hey, look, politically it makes sense to align myself with these guys or to stay aligned with the Pope and so on. So they pick, depending on whatever those factors are, and you do end up with pockets all throughout. But for the most part, for the most part, Northern Europe goes Lutheran. Southern Europe begins to go reform, but it runs into some real obstacles. The biggest obstacle it runs into is France. Uh, Italy, well, I should say Italy as well. Um, the Reformation begins to take a hold. If you know, Switzerland's right next to the northern part of Italy, so it starts creeping into there. But after that, you get very, very strong Roman Catholic presence. Just like today, uh, the medieval church was strongly a, when we talk about the Pope, it was an Italian church. And obviously with the very name Roman Catholic Church centered on Rome, um, we've had some, some ex uh, exceptions here recently, but for the most part, your popes were Italian popes. And to change that culture uh, was gonna be very, very hard. So the gospel doesn't really grab a foothold uh, anywhere but in, in the very northern parts of Italy does not go into much of else in Italy, but it does go into France and really does take hold in France. And there's a thriving reform community in France. And again, without giving you all the details because I'm gonna try to stay on the overview side, um, as that develops, uh, they begin to be persecuted heavily by the French kings uh, who are Roman Catholic. And they're Roman Catholic primarily, again, for political reasons. These were not devout believers or anything of that nature. So they don't see it as in their best interests uh, to, to have the Reformed community there. Uh, the Reformed communities, and really the Protestant communities, and right, and we call them Protestant, they were protesting what the, uh, what the medieval church was doing. But these Protestant churches, both, uh, had a pretty low view of uh, the divine right of kings, the idea that the magistrate automatically rules because you know God, we, they understand that, that God has put them in authority, but they don't have a divine right to that. And so uh, that worries all the kings and they begin to think of rebellion and so on. So the, the various uh, rulers in France begin to put that down. At one point they say, hey, it's okay, everybody can worship in their own way. That doesn't last very long and sooner or later, uh, the French reformed who were known as Huguenots are being kicked all over the map. Some of them even go, I bet you, you probably don't know this, but a, a number of them come to the US. Uh, southern parts of the US, especially the Southeast, of course you know about Louisiana, named after King Louis, uh, that whole section. Uh, Florida was all under uh, the French for, well not all under, but parts of it were under the French for a while. But um, St. Augustine, we think of St. Augustine in Florida, they say it's the oldest continuing uh, settlement or uh, city in the, in the U.S. If you ever get the chance to go, it's worth going. The Spanish ended up there, and of course, uh, that went back into the British and so on before we got it. But the key thing about St. Augustine is uh, very near there, a whole bunch of Huguenots settled in. And the Spanish, you would think, um, would welcome French folks over, but they don't, and especially because they're Protestant French. And so they literally massacre them on the beach. They grab this, um, th imagine crossing all the way across the Atlantic, just like the pilgrims that we're gonna be looking at here uh, later on today. Get the pilgrims to cross over. Well, these were, in one sense, true pilgrims too. They were looking for freedom and a place they can worship the exact same story as the English pilgrims. Uh, they wanted to be free to worship God uh, as, as laid out in the scripture. They arrived to, to Florida and um, literally get all rounded up in one shot put on the beach, you can go see it where it happened today and then get massacred. 
just not, not in a battle or anything, just execution style. Men, women, and children. One of the biggest massacres in US history and nobody ever talks about it. So um, the French Huguenots, almost everywhere they go, get almost wiped out, almost exclusively wiped out. So France pretty much stays pretty strongly um, Roman Catholic. So the Reformed don't take as strong a root in um, Southern Europe as, as Lutheranism does in Northern Europe. It's mostly some, part, some in France, very much in Switzerland. And then it gets into the low countries. And we're talking about uh, Belgium, which uh, goes back and forth with aspects of Roman Catholic, Roman Catholicism and Lutheranism. Belgium is always seems to be in the middle. Everything happens in Belgium. It just, and, it wasn't, and Belgium wasn't Belgium back then, by the way. Um, and then uh, the, the Netherlands, uh, which actually um, back and forth belonged to, sometimes to the French and sometimes to the Spanish. They weren't their own thing either, but they also respond uh, to the reform. So that's what you end up then in Europe with those two. But there's one big player I haven't mentioned. What's the one country I haven't said anything about yet? England. Yeah, the UK, right. So the UK does fall under not evangelicalism or Lutheranism, but does start off being reformed. But again, without going into all the detail, there's always something historically happening. It doesn't take completely. You end up having the reformed churches come in, the people responding almost, almost right from the very beginning, even from before Calvin was on the scene, they're already responding to guys like Zwingli. And you begin having their bishops moving the church in that direction. You all know that King Henry VIII, for political reasons, decides to, he sees the writing on the wall, decides to break away from Rome, but he does it for political reasons, wants to be able to divorce his wife and all that other stuff. Once he dies, the church begins a thoroughgoing reform. And unfortunately, due to historical accidents, which is just to say the way things played out, no accidents, God is provid and his providence controls everything. But you begin having this swinging back and forth, and I won't give you all the details, but throughout the, the 16th century, swinging back and forth, back and forth between a Roman ruler and then that person dies, uh, like when a little King Edward died, Edward VI, and so he's dead. And then you get uh, Lady Jane Grey, who lasts all of a few days before they, they kill her, and that kind of thing. So it goes back and forth between those who were committed to biblical and reform stuff and then back to Roman Catholic. And so uh, there's a lot of fighting, a lot of killing, uh, literally. And so we get to Elizabeth, and when we get to Elizabeth in the 1570s, so it's now been quite a few years since the start of the Reformation, she basically says, enough. We've had enough of this going back and forth. There were a lot of people that still wanted to maintain Roman Catholicism, a lot of people that wanted uh, to be reformed, and so she takes what she literally calls the Via Media, which is Latin for the middle way. And they designed the Church of England, the Anglican Church, uh, which is what Anglican Church of England means, uh, rather, what Anglican means is Church of England. And it is a church that is split very purposefully and artificially between Roman Catholicism and Reform, and it mixes elements, and it does enough that if you are a Roman Catholic, you can feel like you're still kind of there, but if you're Reformed, it doesn't step on all your sensibilities. The worship avoids certain terms and everything. So like when it comes to the Lord's Supper, it uses language that if you're Roman Catholic, you can read into it the fact that the, the, the elements are changed into the body and blood of Jesus, but if you're not Roman Catholic and you're Reformed, it avoids some of the language where it makes that explicit so you can kind of read or pretend that it doesn't happen and so on and so on. So this is a substantial problem, but that becomes then, if you will, um, a subset here. Oh, that's not gonna work, is it? So that becomes a subset. Well, let's not call it UK, let's call it the Anglican Church. So the Anglicans are half Reformed, half Catholic, if that makes sense. Right? They're half Reformed. <laughs> and that's where you get now into the Puritans, and we'll talk more about the Puritans uh, later on this afternoon. But what happens with the Puritans is there's a group of people that say, we're not happy with a half Reformed church. We want it to be purely Reformed. You see the word pure, puritan. The, the phrase, just like Calvinism, 
is actually first brought up as a pejorative, as an attack, you know, oh, you Calvinists, well, same thing with the, the you Puritans, you want the church pure. Later on, they will adopt that name and they'll, they'll accept it. But uh, you get a, a group of people that want to maintain that church. And so it is from that group that we begin getting what we today would call various dom denominations that we have here in the US. Um, so the Reformed have kind of split up. Uh, let's see, how can I put that? We're kind of running out of room here. Lutherans, let me move them this way. But all this is Reformed. So you end up with the Anglicans here. You end up with Puritans here. And then you end up with the, um, well, you know what? We'll just keep that the way it is. So this is on the continent, continental Reformed. And that's what you've got. All the guys on the continent, let's say in the Netherlands and so on. Out of the Puritans, you get two types. You get Presbyterians, right? And you get these Congregationalists. And of course, Presbyterians believe that the church is connected one with the other. And we have elders, where the word Presbyterian comes from, but there's courts for those elders and there's presbyteries and all this other stuff. Congregationalists could still have elders, but they don't believe in the church courts. They think that every church stands on its own and is separate and independent from all the others. And you get those in the Puritans, both kinds. The Puritans, uh, the Pilgrims are actually Congregationalists, and they come to the U.S., now coming to the U.S., talking about the U.S. They come to the U.S. in uh, New England, and of course we know the story of the Pilgrims, and if not, we'll talk about it later this afternoon. But you get that group going to um, the northern, um, you know, New England part of the United States. Presbyterians end up in the mid-Atlantic states, New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, that kind of thing, um, sort of thing. So when the time that you get to the, so uh, let me go back. In Europe, then you end up with really just these churches. The Lutheran Church, the Reformed Church in southern parts of uh, Europe, and in the UK, Anglicans on one side, Puritans on the other, fighting. Puritans, by the way, you don't find them anymore in the UK because after about 100 years, they finally kicked them all out. And they said, we're, we're done with you guys. If you can't line up with the official Church of England, you will be jailed. And that happened um, in 1662. So that's already quite a, a whole century, quite a while later. So up until then, you did have Puritans still fighting for the idea of reforming the, Angl the Church of England completely, not half reformed. But in 1662, the so-called great ejection, all these pastors are kicked out of their pulpits. Uh, remember, these were state churches. That's when you got your money was from the church, and I'm, I'm sorry, from the state, and that's what made you official. All of a sudden, it becomes illegal, and you can't be reformed in any way. So, um, and you end up with what we have today, which is the Church of England in England. Uh, of course, today you're allowed to have other churches in England, but back then you didn't for a very long time. So in the U.S., you get the Congregationalists, you get the Presbyterians. Most of your bap now, and by the way, what happens here, too, is both of these baptize infants. But at some point, the Congregationalists split between those who do and those who don't. Um, so those who do continue to be called Congregationalists, and those who don't get called Baptists, and there were a group already in England that didn't hold to that. Um, they were called the Brownists after the person that um, they were uh, named after, but that group is not all that large. It's not until later on that this kind of sp split begins. There is another group that I haven't talked about at all, talking about Baptists, called the Anabaptists in Europe, and both Lutheran and Reformed hated them. They were basically the Mennonites. We think of the Mennonites today uh, and the Amish and all those. Those are the descendants of the Anabaptists. And I won't get into all their theology, but basically they didn't want to have any church structure as we understand it and so on. They did not baptize their children. They sometimes not always had charismatic elements in terms of uh, not speaking in tongues or anything like that. That's a much more modern thing, but, but more along those lines. They didn't have pastors. They didn't have uh, normal clergy as we see it. So they, their Reformation is sometimes called the Radical Reformation 
and the, both Reformed and Lutheran would have said that they threw the baby out with the bathwater. So the Roman Catholics don't like the Anabaptists and they persecute them. The Lutherans don't like the Anabaptists and they persecute them. The Reformed don't like the Anabaptists and they persecute them. And some of those Anabaptists come to the US and end up being the Mennonites and the Amish that we know about today throughout the Midwest, right? So that kind of sets the stage. But the reason I bring that up is because Baptists do not descend from Anabaptists. What descends from Anabaptists here are, as I said, the Mennonites and the Amish. But that's where you get that. So um, our time is just about up, but that kind of gives you how that breaks down. And to just very briefly get back to a point that Brandon made, um, zooming all the way forward, by the time you get to the Second Great Awakening, 1800, if you had been at the First Great Awakening in the 1730s, 1740s, you would have found in the US some Lutheran, a whole bunch of Presbyterians and Congregationalists. There would have been some Baptists in there. But for the most part, this is what you had. You had Lutheran churches. By the way, the Anglican church, because it was half reformed, you can just imagine those churches never uh, do very well in terms of spiritual stuff because <laughs> you're just kind of playing with too many things that are not right. So in the, in the 1730s, the First Great Awakening, Methodism, uh, um, Anglicanism splits, something called the Methodists. So the Methodists are basically uh, folks who try to reform the Anglican church uh, about 200 years after the fact, but that's when they try to do it. And so you do end up with Methodists as well in the US. So you end up with Anglicans in the US and Methodists. So in the very beginning parts of America, uh, let's say 1789, uh, right, just using that as a date, you got your descendants of Anglicanism, Anglican churches, Methodist churches, you got congregational churches in New England, and you got Presbyterians in Mid-Atlantic, and that's basically it. Later on you get the, the Germans and so on moving into the Midwest. That's a little later. So that really is it, there's not a whole much uh, that happens until the 1800s when you get the uh, Second Great Awakening. And what happens in the Second Great Awakening is, as you said, that push westward. And with that push westward, anybody who didn't like any of these churches, which for the most part pretty much come out and say, here's how, it, how things are. Uh, if you didn't like it, you just go west and you start your own. That's an oversimplification, but not far from the truth. And so you get a lot of folks doing that. And so let's just take our Presbyterianism. Um, as it moves west, basically anybody who didn't like certain things like um, predestination or whatever, you can just say, I don't care for it. And so in Kentucky, you get something called the Cumberland Presbyterians. That's just one example. They didn't like the idea of sovereignty. They never could figure out how free will fits in with the sovereignty of God, which is a key tenet of Presbyterian and Reformed doctrine. So they just jettison it. They essentially become like your Baptists in terms of theology, except they have elders, and that's just kind of weird. So you end up with that kind of splintering happening in the US because of all that freedom. You can just go west and you can do whatever. All the cults, by the way, start around the same time in the US. Uh, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science, all those different groups. And why? Because as you go west, there's no, there's no authority to, to check them out, to hold them in check. Uh, and so they can develop any, any strange view and attract people, and they do. And that's actually how that works as well. Uh, Europe, because everything's a lot tighter, you pretty much stick with these. And it stays pretty much the same. And pre, uh, you know, just about the time of the revolution and before, and this is all we had here in the US. You would have basically have seen reformed churches, a little bit of Lutheran, and like I said, you know, the Presbyterians and Congregationalists, uh, alongside the, the Anglicans is the only way that you would have distinguished them. But after the Second Great Awakening, it all begins to splinter. So anyway, let me just leave it at there at that. That's just to give you a brief historical overview. Do we have any questions before we just stop for today? Okay, does that maybe just give you some perspective of how everything broke out? Okay. And I didn't get into how the Presbyterian Church itself ends up splitting at the time of the Civil War and then by the time of the 1900s becomes a very liberal church theologically and then the OPC splits off in 1936 and all that. That's a fascinating history, but that's, we're really getting away from the Reformation at that point. Just wanted to see how really two churches, evangelical, i.e. Lutheran, uh, 
and reformed and everything flows out of that. Lutheran really doesn't have, a whole, doesn't have kids in this timeline. It's almost all here under reformed with the Anglicans halfway reforming and creating Methodists because of that and the Puritans or the reformed coming out. By the way, I mentioned, you know, um, the Germans coming, but at some point the Dutch come over as well. And so we do end up in the US with reformed that are continental reform and Presbyterian. I forgot to mention that, but they really fall under the same doctrine here. So even though they're not descended from the Puritans. But, all right, if there's no questions, then let's go ahead and stop there. And uh, today, uh, after the service, when we do our Reformation Sunday activities, we will be looking much more particularly at the pilgrims. You probably think, well, I know everything about Turkey and, you know, and Squanto and uh, they're coming over, but we're gonna learn a whole lot more about what was going on with the pilgrims in particular, how they tied into the Puritans, how they tied into this, and why they ended up here. So I think it'll be fun. All right, let me close this with, uh, with prayer. Father, we thank you for your sovereignty, for the fact that you superintend all things in this world, including in the life of the church. And we look at this and we think, Lord, it would have been so much easier if Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli could have just figured things out in 1529. Uh, and, and we find it fascinating that Calvin presented a view of the Lord's Supper that later on Luther said would have been fine and he would have held to that and that would have resolved all the problems. But in your providence, you chose not to do that. Uh, in our simple minds, we would have liked to have seen not just a church that is united and Catholic spiritually, but one that organizationally is as well. But this is what has happened, Lord. Uh, and uh, we know that in the midst of this, it is still your church, and these are still your people. And even though these churches might differ on this point or that point, we still look to Jesus Christ for our salvation, and we still look to the word of God as our authority. And we pray, Lord, that we would exhibit that kind of unity even now as, uh, as we um, find ourselves in different denominations. We pray, Father, that the, gospel, that the gospel would truly take hold in our churches. We desperately need to be reformed once again to be brought back to the authority of the word and have it be the, uh, the only rule for faith and life. Thank you, Father, that even in the midst of all the confusion, that message of the gospel still has been trumpeted uh, in Europe and now in the United States. And as we begin to see both of these uh, continents now, North America, both Canada and the uh, United States and, uh, and all the countries of Europe, having moved away from the gospel, we longed again to see your word lifted up. May you use us to make that happen. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.